Dr. Kalyustu, Professor von Segerser, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is a, a, a topic that I gained recent interest in. And when you start digging into it, it surprised me how much there actually is. In order to avoid scientific misconduct myself, I will just say that uh, I received some slides from INB Croft, and some of them has I, I've, I've taken inspiration from them, and some of them actually copied. So, I will. Uh, his contribution is gratefully acknowledged. Fraud. How often is it? Um, there has been surveys where scientists have been in asked to tell this. Uh, I'm not always aware how these were made, uh, if they were anonymous or if they were face-to-face. -face. But there is, an, uh, there is a publication on, on, online, on internet. It, it's not in a, in a journal, it's on internet. And it's a meta-analysis of these surveys. And then it turns out that 2% of scientists admitted to having fabricated, falsified, or modified, modified data at least once. And one third admitted what they called other questionable research practices. However, the same scientists said that 14% of their colleagues had fabricated, falsified, or modified data. And they claimed that more than two-thirds of them had other questionable research practices. So um, this is quite interesting, especially this difference between 2% and the 14%. Fraud in cardiothoracic surgery. Before, before I uh, coming here, I sent the emails to former and present editors-in-chiefs of the three major journals, and, um, and uh, they all had experience with, uh, among the, those that answered, had experience with fraud in submitted manuscripts. However, in our speciality, we have not had these, uh, one of these big public scandals where important and decisive published data had to be withdrawn. And, and um, we don't know if there's anything that had impact on patient safety, which is, of course, the really dark side of fraud in science. So what is fraud? It's fabrication, making up research data that was never made. Then we have trimming of data. We just cut away some of the, of the data that we don't like and then publish the rest. Then something called cooking. This is if, let's say, a baker makes 100 cakes, and, but when he will sell them, he realizes that um, 75 are not that good. So he, he put forward the 25 cakes that looks very good, and then they are, they are sold because they are the results of his cooking. Then we have falsification, which is manipulation of data and even, even research processes to manipulate the process to give a certain result. Another thing which, and we don't know the extent of this, is suppression, failure to publish significant findings, either because you have some very important sponsor or Maybe you find data that contradict what you have published before. If you have any interest in this topic, I will recommend this book, The Great Betrayal, Fraud in Science, published in 2004. And reading it was quite interesting because it seems that some of the great names in science, they, they have not a clean record. Trimming was performed by Newton, Mendel and Darwin. Falsification by Pasteur and Freud, and actually, actually F Freud invented patients. They, they can, and uh, historians can go back into their notes 
and, uh, and, and raw data uh, and see that they don't find this. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, this was a big scandal in my country um, in two, 2006. It was a female epidemiologist that uh, in, during Christmas two, two, 2005 was sitting reading this paper in the Lancet. She is actually the sister of our prime minister. And th but she was an epidemiologist and she saw that there were patients from a registry that not yet were open. So, and that, and that started. It turns out that there was a lot of patients included in this Lancet paper that uh, did not exist. They were just invented. Uh, and then an international committee was appointed. It turned out that two articles in New England Journal of Medicine was, had to be withdrawn, also one in Journal of Clinical Oncology. This person was a doctor and a dentist. His specialist competence as an oncologist was faked. He was fired from his position as associate editor. He also had a PhD that turned out to be falsified, so that was taken away. He lost the right to work as a doctor and as a dentist. Actually, he was later al allowed to get, have his authorization as a dentist, and now he's working as a dentist up in Song Valley. Then we have this more recent story with Professor Joachim Bolt. And if you look on the left panel here, those are data re re release of interleukin-6 in connection with cardiopulmonary bypass and two different groups. And what actually started the whole thing off was that there were people reading the manuscript that said, when we measure interleukin-6, the standard deviation is bigger. And this, that is what another study at the same time showing, you see on the right panel, you see how much, much bigger it is. This triggered, it, triggered everything off. Turned out that there were no original patient data, no assays performed, co-authors denied participation, and they, and they didn't even know they were co-authors. So uh, th this study was not performed, and this caused a major scandal. He lo as far as I he lost his job, and, and papers were retracted from several journals. Why do people cause fraud? Well, we do have quite an excessive competition to publish. It's about your re reputation, your career, your funding, publish or perish, and of course your career. Your career is blooming when your publication list is blooming, and that is very often the case. Then of course, you have, you have something that is extremely good, important, and then you, suddenly you get afraid somebody else will be there before you. Therefore, you, you, are, you are too quick to publish it. Sometimes you have a demanding boss that even ask for gift authorships from the fraudulent paper. Or maybe you're a bit lazy, so, uh, and, uh, and um, most, I think most instances, in instances of data f falsification, they just want to justify hypotheses that those that do it believe in. And there also sometimes may be a financial factor and maybe sometimes mental illness. I have in my career had three personal contacts with fraud. And in lab experiments performed by a guest researcher, some outliers were not included in the, fi in the final results. Uh, it was just by coincidence that I discovered it because I asked, I was curious, I wanted to look at the raw data. And then I saw there were some outliers. And what happened then? And I asked, why, what, what, what's, what's wrong with them? And they said, he said, they must be wrong because they, they are different. Then, we, I got data from a collaborating lab, 
and, and saw that there were very, very small, suspicious, suspiciously small standard deviations. And I also get access to the raw data, and the data were trimmed. It turned out that this was one person responsible for this, and he was fired from the institution. Then there's an, a very interesting one. A, a guest scientist asked me to read and correct the manuscript he was writing. More de and it was clear to me that more details plus greatly improved statistics were absolutely necessary. But he said this is impossible because all raw data has been lost. When I went to, to your institution, somebody took over my desk and they just uh, throw everything away. The interesting thing is that two years after he went home, his manuscript was published with all changes I had asked for. Maybe the data, after all, was found or not. Plagiarism. Uh, plagiarism is a different thing because it is not dangerous for patients because it doesn't bring false data into the, uh, into the scientific community. It, a plagiarism is many things. It's, we have an intellectual theft, uh, which is that an author claims that words and ideas previously published by another author is actually his own ideas. Then we, then we have the use of words of another author to avoid the effort of writing new text. I think if we look very deeply into our hearts, I think there are very, very few that have published some papers that ca cannot say, sometime I used a sentence from somebody else because that sentence was so good. And actually, that is not a big problem if you use a sentence or just like this. It is when you start to, to copy paragraphs, etc. One type of plagiarism of scientific English, and this is the, the overwhelming most common type of plagiarism, is authors uncomfortable with scientific English. And for all of us who don't have English as our native language. That is a problem. So uh, the, they are taken sentences, maybe chapters, paragraphs, and larger parts from, from somebody else who, who, who wrote in English. Then we have self-plagiarism, and that is another thing. For instance, you take your methods chapter from one article and more or less copy it into the next, and, and nobody really cares about that. So, and, and you cannot steal from yourself. There are consequences of plagiarism that are bad. Um, and, um, and, uh, and sometimes you publicly have to, to correct them. You can be banned, for, if it's too much, you can be banned for, from journals. The work can, in the extremely retracted, you, uh, maybe your institution will be informed. I mean, this is, this is after all, the more serious cases, because if, if the editor or the, or the reviewer is fine, maybe you made this, this uh, paragraph as a plagiarist, you will just be informed and asked to change it, take it away. And in the extreme, there can also be a legal case because of copyright problems. Uh, just a few examples of retraction. This, this paper was, was retracted because uh, uh, the authors had plagiarized part of a paper that already had appeared. This is a, a corrigendum. The, was, was, it's, it's a small writing, so you cannot see it all, but it's stated in the bottom that the authors regret having reproduced a portion of, of test without the use of quotation marks or obtaining permission or making the appropriate literature citation. This is after the, all this discussion with Joachim Bolt, there was a lot of discussions in the anesthesiology literature, and, and um, 
Professor Slater, who is the editor of Anesthesia and Allergesia, wrote several editors on this. And in one of them, he just said, you will be caught. And this is also with plagiarism, because there are no software available for manuscript processing systems. There are a lot of, of uh, negative sides with these as well, because they're actually too sensitive. So they will, if you have written cardiopulmonary bypass, and then the, the software will come up with thousands of articles that have also written so, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. So, um, but you also have to remember, there are people reading your paper, and they have been reading a lot of other papers as well. And there are whistleblowers. And so the two examples I used for you, Sud, Burr, and Bolt, they were both by whistleblowers. If you actually want to reproduce text, you, you see this wonderful sentence, this wonderful paragraph that explains everything you think better than what you, than what you can uh, express it yourself. Then you can put it in, in quotation marks as copy text and cite the, the source in the text, well, in legends, in the reference list. That is perfectly all right. It, it is not more. Of course, then, you are telling the world that you were not the smart guy or smart art, uh, girl or woman who, who, who made this thinking but still, you have it there, and you have made your point. <coughs> also possible for figures, for instance, to request permission from copyright holders. Then we have a very important part, that is the responsibilities of the, the authors. I know that um, Hank Edmonds is just now setting up a new form that authors to the annals has to sign. And I think the point is that even if the, se the senior authors, when we have collaborating institutions, this is more and more normal. You cannot expect maybe the senior authors to have access and re review all raw data. Because in principle, it's the senior author that is responsible. But the, but, but what is, is being set up is that every, that every author has to sign what he or she is responsible for. So every data coming from different places can be connected back to one special person <coughs> who is responsible for that. Because in principle, all authors, including co-authors, are expected to have made reasonable attempts to check findings submitted to academic journals. Then we have also the simultaneous submission of scientific findings, and um, duplicate publication is regarded as misconduct and will have serious consequences for you. Authors are expected to keep all study data for later examination, even after publication. Failure to keep data is misconduct. Then you have to tell about conflict of interest, and also authors are required to provide information about ethical aspects. Redundant publication is another problem. What is a, a redundant publication? Well, it is when you, did, in fact, try to, to make a very simple answer. Uh, Friedhelm said that you have to, to, to write it so people can understand. And redundant publication is actually to try to publish the same thing two times. But uh, it, it is not so that it may be total. It can be that the hypothesis is similar. Um, you see that the numbers of sample sizes are similar. Methodology is, is similar. Results are similar. At least one author is common to both reports. No or little new information is made available. Why is it a problem? Well, it overinflates the scientific literature. And if you have two reports of, or more of the same data, it will influence this meta-analysis. It wastes time of reviewers and editors. It, may, it leads to withdrawals. And um, of course, 
it has in the beginning, if you're not caught, maybe a good effect on the publication list, but in the end, it may be very destructive for your publication list and your reputation. Redone publication is maybe total. You just have the same paper and you submit it to um, different journals. You can have publish one paper and then you have some small changes, minor developments or what we can call salami slicing. You just add five more patients and then you have another publication. Then, then you can publish in another language and that is usually al allowed. Uh, the, you, uh, you, can, you, you can, for instance, uh, ask the, uh, the journal where you publish your paper if uh, I want to publish this in a totally different language, maybe not not within, if published in a European journal, may we want to publish it outside of, of, of Europe in another language, you, you, and you can ask the editor and the publisher for permission for this, and this is very often allowed. Then in the, in the, next, in the next language, you have to actually also to state that this is maybe revised version of what's published, blah, 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 there or there. And you can, and you can have it in an abstract, that is allowed. Here is an example of retraction due to redundant publication. This is from our own journal. Consequences of redundant publication is that you may have an editorial re reprimand from both journals and the editor will remember you. You may have a ban for, for some time maybe lifetime or being on a watch list. So, so, uh, so, so next time your manuscript is coming in, there'll be a red light beside it and they will double check it. And the work may be retracted and you will be d exposed to the whole scientific community, what you, have, what you have done, which nobody wants. Or your institution and superiors can be informed and in the worst scenario, even legal case. So, for all scientific misconduct, don't do it. You will be caught. Thank, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>